I'm sitting in aisle seat 44F on, a, on flight NZ175 from Auckland to Perth for seven and a half hours. This time I'm on the starboard side of the plane and if I had a window I might see glimpses of the continent as we fly. Last time in December I was on the left hand side of the plane on a half empty flight with three seats to myself looking at nothing but ocean. I was writing on that occasion too, composing a short reflection about a project that happened or tried to happen eight years ago in Chile. In 2006, One Shining Gum, Savia Briante, was a project that became an unexpected and grindingly slow narrative, unfolding the kind of optimistic yet unforgiving conceptual material test that now I've deliberately employed in other projects. If you find the good oil, let us know, 2012 to 2014. Let us keep together, 2011. Signs and Wonders Shall Appear, 2010, and Perigee Number 11 for a One Day Sculpture in 2008. One Shining Gum was a sculptural project in which much of my thinking was focused on the act of gifting timber to a country that directly competes with New Zealand in the wood products market and on navigating the protectionist barriers that resisted and deterred interaction of these materials between the two places. Its logic, if you will, involved a simple trade with a landowner in the small rural town of Carterton in New Zealand. The felling of one shining gum, eucalyptus nitens, for two bottles of Chilean Syrah. The full length of the trunk was divided into logs, then housed in a radiata pine crate and shipped by sea to the port of Valparaiso. Safe passage for the crate and its contents was, in theory, ensured with multiple rounds of methyl bromide fumigation, a passport in the form of a phytosanitary certificate and carefully specified as wooden artwork. The logs travelled for three months via Dunedin, Singapore and Hong Kong. There were delays on the docks in the tropics and the crate missed its transshipment connection. I arrived in Santiago and the crate was nowhere to be seen. After I returned to New Zealand, I received a call to say that the logs had been offloaded at Valparaiso and Chilean custom officers had denied their entry. I had the choice of having the logs incinerated on the Valparaiso docks or paying another $1,200 to retrace their three-month Pacific journey and return to New Zealand. More than the memory of failure that edged the non-arrival of the crate of logs for the opening of the Transversa exhibition, what is particularly interesting to me now is that it was the first time I understood what it meant to have a radical shift occur in the conceptual schema of a project, to actively contend with forces, disruptions and interruptions not comprehended or accounted for. It was also the first time I actively gambled with an open-ended proposition that stitched together a pragmatic problem-solving ethos, a romantic belief in possibility, and an attraction to the risk of something not happening. One Shining Gum also demonstrates a love of waiting that has haunted my work for many years. Think of Vladimir and Estragon under the street lamp and waiting for Godot. There is an in inconclusive quality in Beckett's work, characterised by dialogue set in conflict with itself, and his particular view on the absurd, his use of protraction and looping repetition has never failed to appeal to me as a space of unwavering possibility, resilience, resistance and production. If this amounts to a methodology, then it undoubtedly makes a strong appearance and if you find the good oil, let us know. And um, some of you will be familiar with this project from artist talks I gave during my spaced residency last year. It's a project that takes a good long conversation to lay out the narrative and the good oil that unfolded between 2012 and 2014. It was the result of a residency opportunity in New Plymouth on the very western edge of New Zealand's North Island. 
a place that's not really close to anywhere, but it's the centre of New Zealand's oil and gas industry. People fly in, fly out, work offshore. Their per capita income is one of the highest in the country. It has municipal and recreational facilities partially or wholly funded by companies such as Todd Energy and Shell. It increasingly defines itself as an arts and festival centre. It has distinct aspirations to be a destination town. Rather than being resident for three months, I asked if I could come and go in a series of shorter periods across 2012. I like this way of working because it gives me time to think in, a, in an extended way about a place, yet it also fosters a certain gnawing cycle of arrival, embeddedness, disassociation and loss. During that time I was by myself a lot. Uh, there were few people of my independent circumstance to hang out with. I lived in a cliff top cottage and, and developed a daily routine. I walked or cycled to town for coffee and free Wi-Fi. I brought bread at the French bakery and occasional organic goods at the hippie shop with the rainbow flag flying outside. Sometimes I had a beer at the pub. I walked along the ocean walkway a lot for eight kilometres and over the Rewa Rewa bridge where you can see the mountain piercing the clouds on a fine day. I set up meetings with people who could offer me advice, help me with parts of the project, or tell me about things I didn't know. Oh, has it just, that one, maybe move on one more for me. At the end of my time there, if you find the good oil, let us know, had been painted in simple black letters across the facade of the Govet Brewster Art Gallery, while it was closed for renovation and earthquake strengthening. My name was in public circulation via a series of letters to the editor printed in the Taranaki Daily News and the largely vitriolic replies from local readers, lively accusations of uh, the Emperor's new clothes and a waste of taxpayer money formed the backbone of those responses. A city, a city councillor had requested a please explain from the Govet Brewster Deputy Director and my curator had her position restructured and was no longer employed. A little red of a, a little book, sorry, a little red book of letters was produced. A beautiful photograph of a contentious action had been taken, and a shape-shifting, slippery narrative was in play about whales, about oil, about the sea, and about a two-ton concrete block. Although I always framed imaginative force as integral to the conditions of the project, the day I left New Plymouth after four hours offshore in a heaving swell with violent seasickness, I had a complicated feeling that I had done something lasting, yet its elusiveness remained potentially counterproductive to any broader reception. There was an unexpected epilogue, however, a few weeks after I arrived in Mandurah last year, I received news that If You Find the Good Oil, Let Us Know was one of four projects nominated for New Zealand's Walters Prize at the Auckland Art Gallery. Placed under considerable strain in those conditions, the project gathered greater scrutiny on its strengths and its weaknesses, its logic and narrative reach being tested anew. It's 5.48 p.m. my time and the flight map has the plane positioned over Tasmania, almost at Launceston to be exact, although Hobart is the only place indicated on the map. It's odd to look up and be unnerved by the prescience of this. I spent a lot of time in Hobart and some in Launceston in 2011 for David Cross's Iteration Again project. New slide. But it was Antil Ponds in the middle of the Midlands, where I ended up, searching for the ruins of the old halfway hotel in a farmer's paddock, finding the farmer sitting in his kitchen and asking if he would mind a flag being hoisted and a five kilo bundle of newspapers, the size of a lamb, as writer Michael Ed Edwards described it, being airdropped from a Cessna near his ruins every Monday for four weeks. 
Let Us Keep Together was in part a reenactment of an occasion on Octo in October 1919, when the Mercury newspaper promoted the first commercial flight in Tasmania by airdropping a special edition of its papers at points along the Midland Highway to surrounding areas of Launceston. The Examiner, printed in Launceston, responded preemptively by sending out cars to Deloraine and other small townships to deliver its own newspapers to the assembled crowds before the plane arrived. Still owned by rival media corporations, the two newspapers revealed a clear difference in their support for Let Us Keep Together. I was caught up in a fascination with the perceived borders operating in that part of Tasmania that in the space of a two and a half hour drive, alliances and allegiances produced competing breweries, two newspapers, and a north-south divide that revealed a good-natured, yet occasionally embittered and deeply entrenched rivalry in the geography and history of the place. It was reading about the development of semaphore signal stations in the early history of the colony that alerted me to a peculiar obstinacy in local relations how Launceston and Hobart used different signal codes to convey messages, therefore insisting upon a complicated, if not useless, translation system, and a curious undeveloped gap in the Midlands that presented any continuous line of signals between the two towns. I've talked about these three projects because they reveal circumstances in which I have encountered both suspicion and hostility and extraordinary, sometimes unexpected support as a, for a project as it is developed and resolved. The 28th of October, 2834, produced after my residency in Mandurah last year, joins these three as another project that has tested what it means to be a short-term member of a community, sent as a kind of forensic observer or catalytic agent with a difficult request to respond, to interpret, to reveal, to reflect, uh, and to make a new artwork. And I just need to clarify in the next piece here that I'll use the name Mandurah in relation to the place itself, um, and that this, when I say city of Mandurah, I'm referring specifically to local government. It might be useful here to revisit the opening paragraph of my first spaced blog last March. Quote, it wasn't quite a week ago that Marco drove me down here in his little egg yellow egg shaped car. As we drove, he chuckled and he said to me that most artists were going to a place more interesting than Perth, but that, but that I was going to a place less interesting. <laughs> that, <laughs> that thought echoed the conversation I had with Victor when spaced with thinking about where I might want to go. Having initially nominated a few locales on the list that weren't Mandurah, I eventually asked, well, where is it that no artist wanted to go? Victor promptly replied, ah, now that would be Mandurah. <laughs> Always interested in perversely logical methods of decision making, uh, that's essentially how I come to be here. I thought it was funny uh, and that it was an honest attempt to say why I was there. Marco and Victor were a little concerned that I had dropped the minute, and I later heard that a few of the local artists were a bit offended. Looking back, I guess that's where Mandurah and I started to have some friction. It's true, Mandurah wasn't on my spaced bucket list. I had initially proposed ideas for Broom and Esperance. I was interested in Tom Price. I thought about Laverton and Leonora and Cervantes and Denmark. I got the feeling there was some massaging, if not gentle, manipulation happening in the conversations with Victor and Marco and that I was being quietly steered towards Mandurah, <laughs> a markedly different place on the spaced map of communities. It's much bigger and almost considered as the outer reaches of metropolitan Perth itself. Mandurah is a city excited about its future. Exclamation mark. That's its slogan, and much of the associated city of Mandurah literature brightly reports facts on the exponential growth of the city and the Peel region are experiencing. And I'm quoting here. 
Mandurah has retained its relaxed holiday atmosphere despite recent rapid growth as a major sea change destination in Australia. People come on holiday and then they want to stay, which has resulted in Mandurah expanding to offer an exciting mix of residential developments from family homes and modern apartments with new estates to luxurious homes nestled along numerous canal waterways. I'd heard it described as Western Australia's Gold Coast. Like many spaced artists, I explored my future residency home on Google image searches and via Google Earth. I started tweeting pictures I've, I've found before I even arrived. I was a little apprehensive about developing an artwork for a place that seemed to be like a beach resort. But my practice is one based around a process of propositions and problem solving, and Mandra would be no different in that respect. So at the end of my two month stay, my blog post began Quote, I realised at about the six week point that my sense of discovery in Mandurah was subsiding. The weather had got hot again and my trajectory around the town had become quite precise, operating between Woolworths, the organic shop, Dan Murphy's, <laughs> the museum, my chalet, the Sunday market and my almost daily bike ride along Hall's Head Parade towards Blue Bay and the coast beyond, where I have become a habitual visitor. I head out there to rest my eyes and get some different air. When I start to feel pressed upon by too much screen time, the space of my chalet and my own efforts to construct a satisfactory logic for a new project here. Marco once <laughs> said to me, sending artists to communities in Western Australia was like making an arranged marriage. I like that honesty and I think of that terse phrase quite often. Undoubtedly Mandurah has become imprinted in my mind. I clearly and fondly recall familiar details, smells, people and trajectories through the place. I made new friends, and there were things I liked very much and things I did not. But, what my, but my experience was one of increasing discomfort with the expectations that I perceived were at work in relation to the project I was tasked and indeed contracted to develop. It's a community with commendable aspirations to position itself as an art centre in the West Australian context to be another destination town, a place for and filled with creative events, seen to promote a carefully constructed commitment to reconciliation and Indigenous inclusiveness. Yet it's that word creativity that is stiflingly present in its current understanding of what constitutes art and what art can do and perhaps what sh art should do. The rhetoric of the city of Mandurah places art as a tool of self-expression and fulfilment, a benign part of urban development and a useful mode of civic entertainment. It's at this juncture that Mandurah and I find ourselves in distinct disagreement. In that last conversation I had with the city of Mandurah staff, I was reminded that as an artist in residence, I was supposed to be working towards, quote, mutually beneficial and harmonious outcomes. In many ways, I feel the blog posts I wrote form my lasting contribution to Mandurah itself, and they reflect the curiosity and the frustration I had in my experience of the place and its own peculiar tempo and patina. I also strongly maintain that the work I have produced for Spaced to Future Recall could not have been developed without having spent an extended period of time in and around Mandurah. I say to friends and colleagues that I got fired by the city of Mandurah. <laughs> Somewhat melodramatically, I even tweeted that. The city of Mandurah were my hosts, my community partner for the spaced residency, but they recently requested that none of their logos were to be associated with my project. I understand that this is because my conceptual interests crossed the city border to the Shire of Murray, specifically to Pinjarra, a small town about 20 minutes drive from Mandurah. 
and more specifically to the Pinjara massacre site and the contested language operating in the memorialization and active narratives of that site. I explained that I failed to see why, if I'd been taken on a cultural tour to Pinjara in my first week, organized by the city of Mandurah, the narratives of that place were suddenly off limits. For Binjarab Nunga, there is a fluid history of traverse and connection between both places. Workers at the Alcoa refinery live in Mandurah and work in Pinjara. They cross the Serpentine River Bridge every day. The colonial settlement of Mandurah was, for most of its short life, part of the Shire of Murray. And, and this year, there's the distinct threat, or was the distinct threat, I should say, of amalgam amalgamation in which it's likely that Shire of Murray will reluctantly join the city of Mandurah. Quote, it's Shire of Murray business. That was the darkly edged phrase that I remember most strongly from that summary conversation with the city of Mandurah. I discussed the way I resolved the project with my friend Shannon Tayao, a New Zealand artist with Australian and Māori lineage. He looked at me and said, Maddie Leach, you're a strident motherfucker. I said, um, I don't know about that, Shannon, uh, but it seemed the right thing to do. Thank you very much.